All right, we're going to talk this morning about was the prodigal son a Christian? And uh, it's kind of an interesting study here. Uh, now normally, right now in our Bible study, our weekly Bible study, we're going through the book of Luke. And so I was trying to come up with something to preach on. Usually I wait till you know, I have an idea and then I wait till Friday to put the thing together. That way I can, if it has a spillover to Saturday, fine. But I just couldn't come up with anything. <laughs> and to make matters worse, I was sick on Friday, so it was even worse. But uh, I thought, well, why not just go over Luke chapter 15? That's the next chapter. This week we have Thanksgiving on Thursday coming up, so we won't have our Bible study. So you can turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 15. And uh, if you want to hear a message on Thanksgiving, you know, and I, I guess now would be the time to be preaching a thing on, on Thanksgiving, but we already have one on Thanksgiving. And uh, Thanksgiving in the Bible is actually a sacrifice. And it's interesting because if you study the origins of Thanksgiving here in America, it was actually a day of fasting and prayer. It wasn't a day of feasting. You know, we had a lot of Christians here in America when this country was first founded. A lot of the founding fathers were eh, questionable. But a lot of times they they were bowing to the will of the people. You know, they didn't have a choice back then because <laughs> the people were, you know, a lot more if they didn't put up with stuff like we do today. But anyhow, let's start here in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 2. It says here, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Now that's the two basic groups of people that you're going to have in this world, that you're going to run into as a Christian. You have sinners and you have self-righteous people. That's what you're going to run into. There's basically no other group out there. You have people that will admit, yeah, I'm a sinner. And then you have people that say, I'm not a sinner. I'm, I'm a good person. You know, I've done a lot of good things. I've never killed anybody. You'll hear that one a lot. And I'm not like those sinners over there. You know. So very interesting. But uh, we're going to see here in this, in the rest of the chapter here, you're going to see that there are basically three different types of sinners discussed in this passage. Now we're going to look at the first type of sinner, and this one is 1 in 100. Pretty interesting. There's numbers here in this passage. Verse 3, jump down there to verse 3. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons, which need no repentance. Now I want to look at a couple points here. Okay, First of all, did the man own the sheep before they were lost? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, the sheep did not return to its owner. The man went out after the sheep. Notice that. You say, what, try, what point are you trying to make? Okay, well, look at verse 6 there. He says, I have found my sheep which was lost. Okay, there at the last part of the thing. I have found my sheep which was lost. Now, what's going on here? Well, when you read the Bible, you have to, to 2 Timothy 2.15 is one of the key verses to understanding Scripture. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. You have to take a passage and you have to look at it in its historical context and say, okay, who is the Lord speaking to here? All right. Were there any Christians present? No. I know standard interpretation of this passage here, especially the prodigal son, is about a Christian, but the fact is, this is pre-crucifixion. Jesus is speaking. His audience, they are Jews. Now, I want you to think about it from that angle right there, okay? Was a Jew part of God's family? Yeah. By definition, yes, they were. Abraham's seed. God made a covenant with Abraham. And he said, I have promises for you. Okay, and Abraham is often given as a type of God the Father. So, yes, in a sense, they are God's children. Okay, that's why Jesus Christ came to them. All right, that's why it says that he went out after his sheep. Okay, that's, yeah, well, 
Don't get ahead of me. Sorry. <laughs> We're going to be going there. Yeah. Good point, though. Um, but the point is, Jesus is speaking to Jews. Okay? And what was going on? When Jesus Christ came the first time, what was going on? Well, Israel had collapsed as a nation. They were basically in captivity under the Roman legions. And they were pretty much controlled by the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees. And they really were wandering around like sheep without a shepherd. They really didn't know what to believe. I mean, a lot of them didn't even know Scripture enough to realize that Jesus fulfilled all the prophecies given for the Messiah to come. And there's God manifest in the flesh walking around performing miracles and half the people didn't even know who He was. See? He came for His sheep. And we're going to see some more interesting things there. Turn to John chapter 10. You can keep your hand there in Luke if you want to. Of course, it's not a big deal to turn back there either. It's not that far away. But John chapter 10, <clears throat> verse 11. John 10, 11 through 14. Okay, it says here, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is in hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is in hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. Now, of course, there is instruction in righteousness. You can apply this to today. There are hirelings out there that don't care about the sheep. Definitely. You know, and a lot of the pastors out there do not care about the sheep. But notice what Jesus says there. He's the good shepherd. Turn back to Luke 15. And what do we have there in the story? A man going out looking for lost sheep. They're out wandering around. One lost sheep. Uh, pretty interesting thing there. Um... And you, like I said earlier, you have to remember that Jesus didn't initially come for the Gentiles. And I heard something that was kind of interesting. Uh, Dr. Sam Gipta one time said, we are God's plan B. <laughs> the Gentiles. You know, Jesus didn't come and speak to the Gentile people at first. You know, Later on you see there's that tr transition where he starts saying about others are going to come in. They're going to come in from the east and the west and, you know, and they're going to sit down in the kingdom of heaven. You know, you start to see that transition happen. And of course, in the book of Acts, they start out with the Jews, and then as time goes by, they go to the Gentiles. And here we are today. <laughs> you know, But we are God's plan B. Now, it's interesting because, just a little point to illustrate this a little bit further, if you would adopt a child, that child is part of your family. Okay, They can feel comfortable being in your house and everything. They're part of the family. But in a sense, they don't have that that genealogy, they can't say, you know, I mean, right there on the wall over there is a picture of my grandparents. Now, if, if I ever adopted a child or something like that, well, he's part of my family, but he doesn't remember my grandparents. And he's not actually, you know, doesn't know a lot of the relatives, doesn't know all the things that have gone on in this house over the years. See, part of the family, but not the same as one that would be born of me, you know. Now, see, that's the way it is with us as Christians. Okay, You have to remember that. We are born in with the spirit of adoption. And we're part of the family. Okay, We are able to have the promises, inherit the promises that, were, that God gave to Abraham. That's all fine and good. But what a lot of Christians do, where they make the mistake is, they'll go back to the Old Testament and they'll start ripping verses out of the Old Testament and plunking them down to them today. You have to be careful about that. Most of the Old Testament is written to Israel. Okay, and when it talks about heathen people, that's our ancestors. <laughs> you know, you have to keep that stuff in context. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. You can go through, read the whole Bible. I'm not trying to discourage people from reading the whole Bible, but keep it in context. Okay, and I'm going to show you here something here very interesting. Turn to Matthew chapter 15. You say, oh, I don't know about this stuff. I don't know. This just doesn't seem to make sense. You know, I mean, I think every everything in the Bible is for me. Well, look at Matthew chapter 15, verse 22. It says here, And behold, a woman of Canaan. Now, if you study who the Canaanites were, they were basically settling in Egypt. 
So you had Egypt is in North Africa. Um, so basically Africa is where your Canaanites are going to come from. She could have been Egyptian. She could have you know, been more from the southern part of Africa. I don't know. But she was a woman of Canaan. She was not a Jew, in other words. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. She recognized who his, what his race was. Mm -hmm. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Hmm. Mm -hmm. See? That changed later on, but the point is, right there you see it. Okay, you see the point I'm trying to make. All right. Now, we're not going to turn there. You can do this on your own. We've covered it in numerous sermons. But if you go to Hebrews 9, verses 15 through 17, you'll see that the New Testament starts with the death of the testator. When Jesus died on the cross, that's when the New Testament began. All right, not before then. Rightly divide the word of truth. It's just that way. And I do want to add a point here for you, people who like John MacArthur, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Yeah. So it started the death because the blood, the blood was shed. Exactly. I figure it. Yep. Just another chance to kick John MacArthur. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody that denies the blood atonement deserves to be kicked. Mm -hmm. But now, a verse that I came across here, verse 7. Let's read that one more time. and I'm going to show you something here. It's interesting. It says here, uh, Luke chapter 15, excuse me, Luke chapter 15, verse 7. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Now, I read that and, you know, when you get into preaching and studying the Bible and things, you'll be, you'll have two different things. The way you were taught and what it actually means, what it actually says. Now, sometimes the way you're taught is perfectly fine and there's no reason to, to change anything. But I read that and I just kept thinking, I've always been taught that it's the sinner that repents and, you know, that's great and, you know, the other 99 there that they're Christians. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, which need no repentance? Do Christians live without a need for repentance? No. <laughs> you know, I, I know Greg Miller the one time said that the Christian life is a life of repentance. <laughs> You know, and that's very true. And I, I'm just looking at it and looking at it, and I thought, ah, you know, I'll just go on to the next point. I actually did that when I was writing out the notes. I thought I'll just go on to the next point. I'll just say, oh, that's Christians, and, you know, yeah, fine. And it was just like, no, no, no. And it just kept going through my head, which need no repentance, which need no repentance. Who are the 99? And like I said, I was sick on Friday, and I was up like every hour, Friday night into Saturday morning. And I'd wake up, and I'd be like, 99 which need no repentance, 99 which need no repentance. And I just, I just couldn't come, over, come up with the thing, you know, and it was just like, and then Saturday morning, about 5 o'clock or something, I woke up and all of a sudden it was like, light bulb went on. And I just want to say that for a reason. A lot of times the Lord isn't going to reveal something to you the first time you ask. Amen. Okay? Amen. That Bible study is going to be, just hold on. You know, we're kind of like little kids, you know, we're going, I'm hungry. I want something to eat right now, right now, you know. And the Lord says, in a minute, you know, just hold on. Just, you know, I'll get to you in a minute there. But I want it now, I want it now, you know. And it's like the Lord's saying, hold on. And a lot of times I'll go off and find something to eat, you know, and it's not what the Lord wanted. You have to wait on the Lord, okay. So what does it mean? Well, I'm going to give you my interpretation of what it means, and I think that this is what the Scripture is trying to teach here. Okay, now, why would these people have no need to repent? Well, what about a Jew in the, under the Old Testament system? A Jew under the Old Testament system could be blameless, according to the law. We're not going to turn there, but Philippians 3, verses 5 and 6, Paul is talking about himself. He says, Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, the church touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless hmm you see you could do that back in the old testament because there was a system of if you do this if you touch this you're unclean till the evening you have to bring a sin a sin offering to the priest and then your sin is covered not forgiven 
necessarily, not taken away. That didn't happen until the cross, but it's covered. So there's a great ability to abuse that system. And a lot of Catholics have that same thing with the confessional. Okay, You can sin, and all you got to do is just come in and confess to the priest and then do penance, whatever he tells you to do, give, you know, put some money into the thing and or go out and do some good works or whatever. And then your sin is your sin is forgiven. That's what they believe. So you can abuse the system. You live like the devil for six days and then you go in Sunday morning and you do your penance and you're taken care of. And unfortunately a lot of the Jews were doing that. Okay? And they needed no repentance. Because they, their sins were covered. They were doing it according to the law, but their heart condition was not right with God. They were not seeing themselves as sinners that needed a Savior. Sure. See, they weren't wandering out of the way. They were there in the synagogue every Sabbath day, you know, every time the doors were open. But <laughs> the point is, their heart wasn't right with God. So they needed no repentance because they were under the law, but there was no joy in the presence of God and the angels in heaven. But when you'd have a Jew that would say he's out there wondering and God says, hey, you want to come to me as a sinner? And they would say, yeah, I'm a sinner. I'm terrible. Like the uh, publicans and sinners that came to hear him. You know, I was talking to my niece about uh, she was learning in Sunday school about Zacchaeus. You know, we went over the story. You know, why was he up in the tree? Well, he wanted to see Jesus. Why did he want to see Jesus? Because he was a sinner, you know, as you'd say. <laughs> you know, yeah. And that's it. And there was joy in the presence of God and the angels because of Zacchaeus' heart condition. He realized he was a sinner. More than over 99 just Jews that needed no repentance. See? So, there you go on that. Um, now we're going to go on to the next type of sinner. You have the one in a hundred there that think that they're sinners. Uh, the second type is one in ten. Luke chapter 15, verse 8. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now, what's going on here? Well, you have a woman that's mentioned. Okay? Now, there's types in the Bible. Turn to Revelation chapter 12. Who is this woman that's mentioned? Jesus is not teaching about a story that actually, you know, this is, uh, I knew a woman, she lives down the street here. He's teaching as a parable. So he's teaching in type. Rome, or, uh, yeah, Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. It says here, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. I say, who's that? Well, that's Mary. No, it's not Mary. It's Israel. What are the twelve stars? The twelve tribes of Israel. Okay? That's what you have there. That's what's going on. But now, what is the silver? I'm going to show you something interesting. Go back here to Jeremiah chapter 6. And this was the condition of the Jews way back there in Jesus' day. And sadly, it's the condition of the Jews right now. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 26. Okay, it says here, O daughter of my people, interesting, gird thee with sackcloth and wallow thyself in ashes. Make thee mourning as for an only son, most bitter lamentation, for the spoiler shall suddenly come upon us. Let me just stop there for just a second. Are there some spoilers that would like to come upon Israel right now? Absolutely. Yeah, big time. Uh, verse 27, I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people, that thou mayest know and try their way. They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanders. They are brass and iron, they are all corruptors. The bellows are burned, the lead is consumed of the fire, the founder melteth in vain, for the wicked are not plucked away. They're letting the wicked among them. Verse 30, Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. 
Isn't that interesting? The Lord actually looks at these Jews that have turned against Him. They don't judge the sin. They're just, you know, they don't have any desire to fear God or anything. And He says, reprobate silver shall men call them. Hmm. Turn back to... Uh, well, we'll just... I guess turn back to Luke chapter 15. But it's interesting there. It says, O daughter. You know, kind of like the woman again. But uh, it says here in Luke 15... Uh, where am I at here? Verse 8. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle. Does anybody think of what that is a reference to? Turn back to Matthew chapter 5. So you have these Jews that really don't have any use for the Lord or anything, and they're you know, living in sin and wickedness. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. And Jesus is talking here too, specifically in Matthew chapter 5. This is going to be really truly fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. But he talks about Jerusalem being the city of the great king over in verse 35. But verse 14, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And we're back to the Father thing. Jesus being the, or God being the Father of the Jewish people. But what's the problem there? Well, you have these Jews, you can turn back to Luke 15, you have these Jews that are reprobate, they're not judging sin, they're not really seeking after the Lord, and what do they need to be doing? What do they need? Well, they need the candlestick. They need the light of the gospel is what they need. And right now, that's very, very true of the nation of Israel. I actually listened to an interview of a Jew living here in America and a Jew living in you know, Jerusalem. And he was saying, this young man, he was a college student in Jerusalem, and he was saying that he tries to talk to his fellow students about, you know, this is our land. This is the land which God gave to our father Abraham. You know, And he said most of them are just like, whatever. I don't care, you know, no big deal, you know, eh, who cares, what's the big deal? See, they don't care about that godly heritage, they don't care about it. We're going to see a little bit more about that as we continue here. We're going to look at the third type of sinner. Okay, well, first there we had the sheep that was wandering out of the way, that was one in a hundred. Here you have reprobate silver, okay, that's one out of ten. Now you have one out of two, <laughs> This is the majority of what they're going to be guilty of. Um, Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. Okay, now you have two different sons mentioned in this story. You have the older son and the younger son. Okay, now both were sons of their father. Right? They weren't adopted. Um... Verse 12, the younger son asks for his inheritance. Okay, now it was rightfully his. Yeah. Right? But he wasted it. Now what Bible character also showed disdain for his birthright? Uh, Esau. 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 Turn to Romans chapter 9. We're going to see what God thought about Esau. Romans chapter 9. We'll see some interesting things here. Romans 9, verse 7. Okay, it says here, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Okay, you have there Galatians, that's really explained, where you have Ishmael, the son of, of Hagar, Get back to the Old Testament story there. He was the son after the flesh. Okay? Um, you had uh, Isaac. I guess it was. Isaac was the son that was born after the promise. Okay? Uh, that's what it's talking about there. But look at verse 9. 
for this is the word of promise, at this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. Okay? Now the descendants of Ishmael are not going to inherit the promised land that was given to the Jews, that's promised for the Jews, unless they are Christians. They can get saved, and then they can get in on the promises. But, you know, a lot of them think that they are God's chosen people, and they're not. Yeah, they sure not at all. To fight their way into the promise. Yeah, they're trying to fight their way into promise, but it's not going to work. No. Look at verse 10. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, having neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. That's kind of interesting, and you're going to see that in the story of the prodigal son. The younger son, even though he messes up, ends up coming out on top at the end of the story. And the elder brother is the one that has a problem. And, and uh, now look at verse 13. This is a verse that's foreign to a lot of modern Christians. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. It does not say Esau's sin have I hated. Esau have I hated. Why did God hate Esau? Well, there's a couple good reasons for that. Uh, but the main thing where it all kind of began, Genesis 25 verse 34, I'll read it here quick. It says, Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. It was kind of like the prodigal son there. He had this birthright, this inheritance that was given to him. And what did he do? He just traded it for food. Just went out and wasted it. I mean, what a terrible thing to do. But see, there again, you have the thing of the Jews. They have a land that's promised to them. That land is not promised to us until we get saved. Mm -hmm. Then we become adopted into the family. Yeah. But a lot of Jews, unfortunately... In Jesus' day and also today, they could care less about their inheritance that God has planned for them. Pretty sad. Go back to uh, Luke chapter 15. Luke 15. Now we're going to go to uh, verse 12. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living wanted to read that one more time. Verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. There's a lot of Jews here in America that do just that. They go to, to this far country. They don't belong here. Go back to Jerusalem. I'm not saying that as a racist, racial thing, but that's where God's going to bless them. Okay? They need to be back there. They should respect their inheritance and not come over here and waste it with riotous living. All right? Uh, verse 14. Go there. Uh, and when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Going from his father's house, going out and, and getting to such a lowly position where you're out there feeding pigs you know yeah unclean animals exactly for a jew to be feeding you know a servant to unclean animals <laughs> that's a bad thing make some spiritual application there too but you know yeah it was, it was bad um and it's kind of interesting because if you go back to genesis we're not going to but if you go back to genesis 25 is where it's talking about esau despising his birthright and right after that happens Genesis 26, verse 1 says, And there was a famine in the land. Hmm. Kind of weird. Hmm. You maybe, maybe Jesus is referring back to the story of Esau a little bit. Telling that as a parable. Uh, verse 17. Luke 15, 17. We'll see what happens here. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. 
And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Now you can read through the Old Testament, the Jews many times were buying, they had men servants and maid servants. Okay, and it wasn't always a bad thing to, to be a slave in the Old Testament. Many times if you came into a city, it was considered an act of mercy to be taken as a slave. Because what was the other alternative? <laughs> the sword. <laughs> you were killed. So it wasn't always a bad thing. But the point is, this Jew here, the prodigal son, he thought to himself, well, obviously I blew it. You know, I, I've messed up. I've, I've wasted my inheritance, kind of like Esau did. So I'm pretty much hated by God right now. So I think I'm just going to go back and say, I'll just be like a slave to you. Okay? Didn't happen though. The father took him back. Why? Well, because he was his son. He was part of the family, you know, the, the genealogy there. Verse 22. Uh, but the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now, here's where you're going to have people that try to go, and they try to teach this as a Christian that's out of fellowship with the Lord, and they'll say, Now see, verse 24, This my son was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. And they say, well, See, that's a guy that lost his salvation, now he's saved again. It's not teaching that. Not even close to teaching that. This is about a Jew that left his family. He never stopped being a son of his father, did he? You know, even if he wanted to use this as a thing for eternal security, he never stopped being a son of his father. So, even if you want to try to apply this to Christians, you can't teach that you can lose your salvation from it. He didn't say, well, you were my son, and now I'll have to remake you my son. He was the son the whole time. Okay? So, it wouldn't wouldn't teach, yeah. Once a son, always a son. Once saved, always saved. <laughs> you know, it doesn't teach that you lose your salvation. That's nonsense. Okay, what's it about? Well, it's about restoring fellowship with your father. You know, and the church, the Christian church, didn't exist yet. Keep that in mind as you're reading through the Bible. And it's kind of interesting because you know, again, if you want to try to apply this to church age doctrine. Does that mean that the Lord has to throw a party every single time a sinner repents of their sin, or a saved Christian repents of their sin and gets resaved? <laughs> you know, <laughs> heaven would be like one big party. <laughs> you know, as much as we sin. I mean, give me a break. It's just ridiculous, this teaching that you can lose your salvation. All right, <clears throat> not true at all for today. Uh, anyhow, continuing here Luke chapter 15, verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and would not go in, therefore came his father out, and entreated him. Hmm. Verse 28 there says, He would not go in to his father's house. He wouldn't go into the party for his brother that was a sinner and came to the father. Hmm. Matthew twenty three thirteen says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Hmm. Isn't that what the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees were doing to those people? They were holding those people in bondage and they were saying, you don't want to go into that kingdom of heaven. Don't go over there. That Jesus, he's a heretic. We forbid you to go over there. That's what they were doing. Hmm. Who's Jesus speaking about here? He's speaking about the two groups there that you see in, Matthew, or in, in chapter 15 here in verses 1 and 2. Publicans and sinners, that's one group. Pharisees and scribes is another. Very interesting. And, you know, the older brother there is very obviously a picture of a self-righteous Pharisee. And he didn't want to go into his father's house to hang out with sinners. A sinner like his younger brother. Now, look at uh, verse 29. It says here, And he answering said, unto, or said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee, 
neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. You could say he needed no repentance. Could they have lived like that without transgressing transgressing the commandments of God? Under the law, blameless. If you transgress the law, you just go, you do this sacrifice, and that's it. You know? Mm-hmm. So here, you know, again, you see that Pharisee thing. But uh, anyhow, continuing here. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me. He was a Jew. He had the, the inheritance. And all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. Okay? He's still a brother. He's still a son of the father. But the point is, he was dead as a sinner, and now he's alive again. The fellowship has been restored. He left his father's house. He left. He didn't care about the inheritance, but now he's back. Okay? Mark chapter... 2 verse 16 and 17 I'll read this real quick it says and when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners hmm that's kind of interesting where did we just read about eating um, they said unto his disciples how is, he, how is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners when Jesus heard it he saith unto them they that are whole have no need of the physician but they that are sick I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance Jesus came for sinners okay not self-righteous people. <laughs> Just as simple as that. And the party, if you will, in heaven and in the millennial kingdom is for saved sinners. All right? And of course, you know, I kind of covered this already, but the thing of the elder son there was an heir according to the promises made to Abraham. You see that there in verse 31. Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. So again, this is written to Jews. All right? But now notice something. Was it the father's choice to not let the older son come in? Or was it the older son's free will to not enter in? The older son's free will. Hmm. What's that thing about free will and predestination and election and all that stuff? Yeah. Another little problem there. Uh, John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, a man has to be born again. What's that mean? Well, what it said there, this thy brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. You can't get into heaven unless you're born again. And it doesn't matter, there, you know, that crosses dispensational lines. Okay, that's for Jew and Gentile. You have to be born again. You must be born again. All right. Just a couple more points I want to make here and then we're done. So what do you have there? Well, you have three different types of Jewish people. That's who Jesus was addressing here in this chapter. One in 100 is wandering around like a lost sheep, not knowing what to believe. Okay? A lot of them do know what to believe. A lot of them have their system, you know, that they're in with the whole Orthodox Jew thing or there are other branches of, branches of Judaism. Some of them are not technically wandering, but a lot of them are. Okay, and the Lord goes out after him. I think it's a wonderful thing when a Jew gets saved. It's a great thing. One in ten today and back then is reprobate. Okay, they could care less about judgment. They don't care about sin or anything else. They're just reprobate silver, as it talks about there. And that woman, that you know, Israel. It's great to see a Jew actually come back and respect that inheritance that they have. It's like she goes out. Israel goes out and says, "Hey." You're a Jew. You belong over here. You belong doing the things that you're supposed to. Okay, and one and two is self-righteous and trusting in their own good works to get to heaven. If you talk to an Orthodox Jew right now, that's their plan of salvation. You know, very similar to, to Catholicism. Doing good works and dying in a state of grace. Alms and prayers, you know, and, and going over and doing all the Orthodox Jewish type of thing, and, and they hope that they're going to make it. They're not going to make it. You must be born again. So, just to sum up here, 
Number one, the prodigal son was not a Christian. Okay? It was a type of a Jew. Right? Get that thing straight. Now, you can use it for instruction in righteousness. That's there, certainly. But you got to be careful of that stuff. Okay? Luke 15 has nothing to do with eternal security. Actually, if you, if you want to say, it actually proves eternal security. <laughs> you know? Because uh, it's a, a son, he never stops being a son. Uh, and the third thing I want to say here is God is not the father of a Gentile until they receive the spirit of adoption. Okay, so we can't claim some of this stuff in here. All right, we are not in the family of God. We are not the seed of Abraham until we are adopted. All right, you have to keep that stuff in mind. So that's going to do it for this morning. Uh, hopefully, next time I'll have a little bit more of a detailed sermon, but. Uh, this kind of a rough one here this morning. But uh, we'll close here with a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, I do thank You once again for Your Word. Just a tremendous gift. And, I, and Lord, I do thank You that You've uh, adopted me into Your family and adopted everybody here this morning. Um, Lord, I sometimes wish that I was Jewish so I could understand a lot of the customs and a lot of the history that You have with Your people. But, Lord, I'm just so grateful to be born in to that family. And, um, Lord, I pray for everybody out there and everybody here that uh, they would never fall for any of this anti-Jew stuff that's out there. Your Word says that we're not to boast against the natural branches branches, um, because you won't spare us, Lord. You'll, you'll punish us for that. It's a, it's a great thing to be born into this family. And uh, so I just pray that this week, that everybody listening and everybody here would remember the sacrifice of thanksgiving. As your word says, in all things give thanks. And we would be truly thankful for the things that you've blessed us with. And um, so I just pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.